It's the Growler with PD and J. Here to analyze for you today. From Growler Bad to Jay's Got Sad. We hope you enjoy this episode of the Growler Podcast. All right, welcome into the latest edition of the Growler PD and J. Paul Dater Jr., Jay Morrison here with you on a Thursday. What's up, Jay? Hey, doing great. Looking forward to this game this weekend. There is there is a lot on the line. There really is. There is a lot on the line. We're going to do one of my favorite things to do in today's show, Jay. We're going to do the two fake walkouts, okay, <laughs> where we're going to give a feeling of what it might feel like after a win how it might feel after a loss as the Bengals take on the Ravens, because as Joe Burrow said, big week for the Bengals, big week for the Bengals. Yeah. There is no way around that. They have uh, positioned themselves to make this a absolutely massive game on Sunday at Paycor stadium. One o'clock uh, Jay and I will be there and we'll have the walkout for you afterwards with the real walkout uh, breaking down everything that that goes on, but there's plenty more. Uh, for us to talk about today, we're going to have news uh, on something we saw on uh, this week that I don't think that we've seen. I can't remember the last time we saw what we saw in the defensive line room. Uh, and so we'll talk a little bit about that. We've got a couple of major questions. Of course, a check in from Natasha B, our great friend in Hawaii, mm-hmm. who has a great question to send us off. Uh, run past her boots. Growler bets that we're we're gonna try to elicit a winner this week. See if we can maybe get a winner out of it. Uh, predictions, all of that stuff is coming your way here on today's show. Um, reminder: our next live show is going to be it's ten twenty seven October twenty seventh uh, at BetMGM Nation Kitchen and Bar at the Banks. You know it. It is just such a great venue down there. Three dollars Cincy lights. Great food, world-class burgers, uh, you name it. It's just an awesome place to go watch games, put your bets in, hang out with us. We'll be giving all kinds of stuff away. It is going to be a blast. That will be a noon show for us. on the That's the 430, 425 technically game against the Eagles. But we'll be down there having a, having a great time. Those shows have been so much fun. And Jay, second chance drawing. Is second chance drawing happening for you tonight down at – down at uh, Bet MGM, you got your ticket. Your lo- I, I assume you have a losing ticket somewhere. I actually have two this week, so <laughs> I'm going to double my chances. Two losing will... tickets in the bucket because you can win $100 in bonus bets, $100 in nation gift card, or 50 or 25 It's first, second, third place they pull out. Every Thursday at halftime of the Thursday night game, you can get down there. And so bring your losing tickets, <laughs> buy Jay a beer, and then he'll buy you a beer once he gets his gift card. <laughs> <laughs> so make sure you show up down there all right uh let's go through some news jay um this, the defensive line room rises from the dead the cavalry the, the cavalry has sort of come it was it was honestly odd what, what did you think looking out of the defensive line room during wednesday's practice being like huh there they all are well almost all of them sheldon yeah. rankin's still uh working his way back but there they all were together. It's it proof that they can exist standing upright in uniform and helmets in the same place at the same time. Yeah, I mean, looking out there, it was different to see. I thought it was really seeing that, that, that I mean, Trey was limited. Even Zach wouldn't say was whether he's going to practice or not during his pre-practice news conference. Um, but to have Miles Murphy go full and to have McKinley Jackson go full – I, I think it's a great sign, obviously. You got B.J. Hill back. It seemed like he was close last week. I, you would expect him to play. Miles sounded like he's going to play. It's, you know, I, if you were going to get these guys back, this is the game you wanted to get them back for. And and so I just I, – I think it's a great cause for optimism. I, I don't know that this defense is going to totally flip the switch and, and all of a sudden become world beaters, but – you, you got to think they've got a much better chance to actually slow down. I don't know if you're going to actually stop the Ravens, but getting all these guys back. And it's, it's, it's important too, because if you just get one or two back, you still figure 
they haven't done a lot. They're going to be limited, and it, it, that affects your rotation. But when you have this many guys, you can just start cycling them through and and keep them fresh. And it was it was it was an encouraging sign to see every one of those guys out there. Even Sheldon Rankins was on the field for the first time. He hasn't been doing rehab work. He was out there yesterday doing rehab work, so he's getting a little closer as well. I mean, BJ Hill is going to be a big lift. Yeah just to give you some sort of professional snaps, and then you'll have the increased role for Chris Jenkins. But to me, beyond what we saw, which was all of those guys actually out there together, um, was the conversation with Miles Murphy that we had afterwards. And, you know, we there's been a lot of discussion of I don't knows and will sees and will he be back by week five? Mm. You know, he's kind of like not really sure and hopeful, but but not really sure if, if he'd be back off this knee injury. Um, and then you talk to Miles yesterday. And and now disclaimer, what do we always say here? Don't believe a word a player tells you about their injuries. <laughs> but I feel like that's more in the immediate aftermath. When you get right. closer, when he's had a month plus to be dealing with this and thinking about getting back and noting where his body is at with it and be able to speak as confidently as he did. Um, it goes a long way. I have cut up a small portion of a longer conversation with miles Murphy at his locker yesterday, talking about this injury, how he feels coming back, what he needs to see out of himself the rest of this week. And uh, I, I thought, you know, I kind of came away with some raised eyebrows saying, wow, Mm -hmm. That dude's ready to go. Here's Miles Murphy from Wednesday. How did, you, how did you feel today? I felt great, honestly. Uh, I was about to say, I also on the coaches, I felt, felt great doing all the drills, uh, doing the team team runs, uh, just getting off. I uh, felt fast, felt explosive. So a lot of things, a lot of things felt good. Uh, tomorrow's third down day, so that's gonna, that's going to be a day where you know, pin the ears back, just fly, fly, get off the ball. So that'll that'll tell a lot. Is it hard to have caution and know that you don't want to come back too early because you want to come back and have an impact? Is it hard to be like, well, I better make sure that I'm all the way, or do you feel like that's an easy thing to feel where your body's at? I feel like for me that's an easy thing to feel, honestly, because um, even all even all last week when I wasn't, I guess, wasn't able to play in the fourth week of IR, I still felt I still felt really good and very confident in all the movements that I was doing. So. Actually, being on the field today and running around and bend, bending the corners and all that, it kind of was just like a confirmation that you felt good. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Kind of word, yeah, yeah, almost like confirmation. So yeah. Yeah, it felt good. Yeah. Um, what were you like? What made you the most confident on the rehab field when you were doing all that work? Was there stuff, some, something that was happening over there where you're like, man, I'm good? Was there something that Nick was putting you through that you were like, man, if I can do this, I feel like I'm ready or close. Uh, really just get offs. Yeah. When the get offs felt as powerful and as explosive as pre injury. So yeah. that um, getting up to speed, being able to do long strides at like nineteen ish miles an hour. Yeah. So that, that felt that felt really good and that was that was kinda of like the starting point of um, pretty much there. Yeah. There's Miles Murphy, you know, I, I you know, with him talking about how his get off of the line felt better than pre-injury. I mean, that was the one that stood out to me, even as much as I started thinking about him running over 19, 20 miles per hour, 21 miles per hour at 270 pounds. Uh, but that said, I thought when he, that was the one to me that said, look, when you're on the rehab field a week ago and feeling like you are getting off the ball, like you were pre-injury, that's a, that's a great sign that you can go out there and give this team what they sorely need. Yeah. And, and you said, it. I mean, these guys do sometimes inflate how they feel. I, I didn't get that sense from Murphy. Like he was kind of talk, trying to speak it into existence. He does really feel good. And I thought maybe the most interesting thing he said is he was, I can't remember who asked him. Someone asked him about being on a pitch count. And he said, we've had conversations about that. And I don't think that's going to be the case. So, they're talking about him playing. That that is the plan is for him to play. And so mm -hmm. I don't think this is him saying, you know, just being hopeful. He's going to be out there and that's that's going to be huge too. That's going to help limit uh Sam Hubbard snaps and make him more effective and they just you got to get pressure from someone other than Trey Hendrickson and and you don't know. I mean, yes, we expect Trey Hendrickson to play, but he is Zach said it. This is a very painful injury and he's a tough guy, but 
you don't know if it, if he's going to be able to finish. You assume so if he's out there playing, but getting a guy like Murphy out there, a guy that everybody kind of expected to take that big step this year, you don't know what you're going to get in the first game back, but it, it's it would seem to be better than what they've gotten from anyone else this year besides Hendrickson. So just the the talking about the explosion in the get off, gonna have to have that. And again, he's a guy that speed. 19 miles an hour is insane. For any of you that have ever been on a treadmill, just try to go 12, try to go 13. It's hard to keep <laughs> up. That That's going to be important against this team and, and all the speed they have and Lamar and, and Derrick Henry and Justice Hill looks incredibly fast. So chasing those guys down, not he's not going to run them down from behind, but laterally and, and, and keeping that part of it in check. I just think it's going to be a huge benefit to get him back. Yeah. No, it, I mean – there's so much pressure on Miles Murphy to come in and be a guy right away. Mm-hmm. They're just because of the situation that they're in and, and the expectations placed upon him, uh, a first round pick in year two. Like they just, they so badly need it. And uh, we'll see what it looks like in, in, in his first game back or how much of a ramp up period we end up excusing away or, or how much that plays into it. But we'll, we will see. It sounds like the good news is we will see though. Yeah. We, we will see uh, on Sunday. So the defensive line, you know, McKinley Jackson was back out there too, and even had a full participant. I, I just don't, I don't anticipate there being a thing where he's back right away in the mix. They just don't know enough about what they're getting there. Mm-hmm. Um, so for him, he's out there, but I, I don't know if you're going to see impact there. I think you're still just doing the rotation with Hill and Jenkins and Guy, and probably you know either Zach Carter or Jay Tufele. Um, it more in the background though, with Jenkins soaking up the majority of those snaps at this point. So, uh, and then Hubbard kicking inside in spots if they need to need to do that. But I think you, it looks a little more professional. It certainly it looks better to the eye. I'm sure there maybe a Lou Anaruma might have shed a tear looking over to the defensive line <laughs> individual drills uh, on Wednesday. So uh, a, a big development there. Another thing yesterday before we get into kind of the the, the crux of the show here, Cam Taylor Britt. Uh, talked for the first time since what happened this weekend and, you know, said all the right things, Jay. Like, I thought, mm-hmm. and that's great. I mean, considering he hasn't been saying all the right things <laughs> a lot lately, uh, had great perspective on what happened with him and and sounds motivated by it and sounds understanding that, hey, there's nothing guaranteed to him in terms of being out there or whatever. He's got to be the one to go out there and play a certain way and that the mistakes and the issues that got him on the sideline were very easily fixable technique stuff, like stuff that is easy for him to go and say, okay, I got this now and stay settled down. And they're going to need that from him uh, because you know that Lamar is going to be trying to go after him over the top without question. But um, I I thought it was good perspective from him and, and, and handling it the right way, which is what we have kind of heard from coaches to this point and time will tell if he goes out there and, and plays better or what happens, but um, did seem to be taking things in, in good spirits. Yeah. And he was, he stood there for a long time. It was wave after wave of reporters that came by to talk to him and he was, he was willing to stand there and answer any question. It wasn't, it never felt like there was a speech writer, so to speak, that, that was telling him what he needed to say. It was all coming from the heart and, you're right. With the technique he was talking about, trying to make a play and trying to jump a route and, and get an interception and kind of what Lou talked about on Monday with the eye discipline. And he was cheating a little bit. And then one false step against an NFL caliber receiver and you're reaching and grabbing as opposed to just bumping the guy off the line. And and that's what we saw. That's why those guys got behind him. He didn't just suddenly get slower. The, the technique just went south and he was playing catch up. So I do. I think it was a really important lesson learned. And I'm interested to see. I, I don't I don't know. Even if he plays, I, I expect him to start. And even if he's playing well, does does Lou just stick with him the whole game? Or does he do they continue to work DJ Turner in? Because he's earned the snaps. He played really well. He played well against the run and the pass against Carolina. So I, I think that's it's a hard decision for Lou, but it, it's a it's a good problem to have. You know. Cam is a little bit more of a physical player, obviously, Mm -hmm. and that's something that you want in this game when you know you're going to be asked to tackle on the outside a lot. This feels like a game built for him yeah. uh, in terms of just his physicality out there. 
Um, and we have seen Dax Hill have trouble tackling uh, on the outside. So maybe maybe there's some snaps that come off of him when you just know you're you're going to be matching with base potentially when they're out there and they're two tight ends and they're just hammering the ball down your throat. So you're going to have less corners on the field. The ones you have out there, you want to make sure they're short tacklers. I mean, so many of those runs they have do bounce to the outside and run off zone reads and stuff like that. So there's, it's hard though. Like they, they bring speed and they bring power and that's yeah. what makes them su- such a tough matchup right now. You can't necessarily match personnel wise. Cause the moment you put a bigger guy out there, they find a way to get him matched up, having to chase down Lamar Jackson and good luck on that one. Uh, so a little bit of background on, on kind of what went on there before. Okay, before we go and flip forward and and get into talking a, a little more in depth on this game, I want to talk a little bit more about our good friends at Future Fans. Now you know, you know we we've got kids here, and, and I've got I've got two young girls that we've been trying to teach the game of football, and this has been a blessing so that you can have your kids understand football and make that connection with them as you watch the games and, and become a big fan. They send you this giant, look how big it is, Jay. It's like, <laughs> it's huge. <laughs> uh, but that's because when you open it up, you have this book on top and that's sort of the story that winds everything together. And they go one, ch- one or two chapters at a time. And, you know, there's the touchdown dances in there and some of the basics of them going to this camp rally who, and, and they're teaching some of the basics of, of how not how football works, but about how things parallel to football work. So that when you go to turn to start watching football, you can, and you open it up and they got these boxes. And so you get to do unboxing and kids Mm -hmm. love unboxing stuff, you know, one box at a time. Here's some, there's a bunch underneath that. And every time you have a session, you open up new boxes and they get excited about that. And then they're excited about whatever it is. And that's something that helps them learn football, whether it's, you know, these little beanbag tosses that help you learn about how downs work by doing something similar to that. Uh, All of it's really fun. All of it's great. It worked for my kids. Like they get football. Now we talk about football. We watch football together. It has worked for tons of them. They're growl pals. They're, they're one of us. They're just awesome. Uh, you can get this at King Arthur's Court in Oakley. You can go to the Future Fans website, forty nine ninety nine. Uh, use Growler, get ten percent off. We're delighted to be, uh, you know, helping you guys know that you, if you have kids, how great it is. Help them learn the game along with you. Futurefans.com. All right, Jay. I want to play a. Uh, I want to play a little game here that we've done before, and. That game is going to be about two fake walkouts, okay? This is spawned by our great friend, Natasha B. And she says, hey, guys, hope you're well. Thank you. I really needed this show to help me cope watching defense the past two weeks. <laughs> we knew she was going to be in a bad place after we, we, we saw her at the Monday Night Football show, uh, knowing that that was going to make her whole trip, and it would be ruined if they lost, and then it must have been ruined. But that said, uh, she said, I know you don't, Paul, I know you won't agree since it's only week five, but hear me out. This week is a must win. That's right. I'm pulling out my wristband and <laughs> slapping it on the table like that. I'd love if you folks would talk this through a bit. How different does literally everything feel? Morale, vibe, season outlook, confidence, fan interest, belief. If this team is one in four after maybe being run all over by the super annoying Ravens versus two and three after beating a team that just embarrassed Buffalo. I think it's stark and a truly season-defining difference. Please discuss. Keep up the great work. Aloha, Natasha B. Missing the waves in the background of that email, yeah. but we'll just pretend that they're there. Shh. Shh. Ah, see, it, it, people need to be calmed right now anyway <laughs> with the state of, of the importance of this game. So let's do it. Two fake walkouts, Jay. Let's start with the negative. If the Bengals lose to the Ravens. All right, here we go. All right, welcome into the latest edition of the walkout on a day where unprecedented things happened at Paycor State. And the Ravens ran for 428 yards. Derrick Henry goes for 278. Breaking records left and right. Breaking tackles left and right. The Bengals had no answer 
the strength versus weakness that you were worried about was exploited. The Bengals are now one in four. They have proven to still have these AFC North problems. They were beaten up in the trenches. Joe Burrow was not enough. Jay, where do the Bengals go from here? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. You you thought that once they started getting some of these guys back on defense, the defense defensive issues would be resolved and they were worse than they've ever been today. And yes, you're playing a great Ravens team, but this is going to be hard to overcome. You Mathematically, one and four, two and three, it's a one game difference. Realistically, this is massive. It it's just this is a hole that I don't know that they can dig out of. I don't know what gives you hope that they can dig out of it. It doesn't matter how good Burrow and this offense plays, as long as that defense keeps looking like that, there's really not much hope for the rest of the season. The last 10 years, teams have started exactly one in four. There's 55 teams. Five made the playoffs, nine percent. So 91% missed the playoffs. That's not good. Nine had winning records. That's 16%. This is where you're at right now. The, and, and you and you can know you have to go through the AFC North and prove yourself again to be a team that struggles going through the AFC North. Six straight losses in games that matter in division. And it yeah. looked the same as so many have before them. This team has an AFC North problem. And now they have a 2024 season problem and a big old defense problem. All right. Yeah, I mean, that's how it feels. It. That's how that's how it feels, Jay. Yeah. The loss. That's how not it good. feels with the loss. Not not a good feeling. That was a pretty dark tone. I still hope you'll listen to the walkout, even if it feels <laughs> like that. Let's take the flip side now. Let's take the flip side of if they find a way to win at home and beat this Ravens team that so many are a fan of. All right, welcome to the latest edition of The Walkout, where the Cincinnati Bengals at Paycor Stadium find a way, and Joe Burrow pens another chapter of his legendary story as they win 31-28 to over the Ravens. Burrow and the offense go off. A couple critical turnovers against Lamar Jackson, and bam. Guess what, folks? Despite everything that happened in the September from hell, this team is now just where it was the last two years, two and three, which ended up in great places for where they wanted to get at the end of the day and able to beat, you know, the kings of the AFC North, able to take it to them, able to slow that running game down just enough to make plays and let this offense carry them. This offense can carry them. It can carry them through the AFC North, and they are now perfectly positioned. They'd like to have a couple more wins, but they are in a great spot to make the run that they've always wanted to run, sitting in a great place in the division. Boy, what a difference a day makes. Yeah, I mean, this is when it typically starts for them. They, they get through that first month of the season. They get things turned around. They were still kind of fighting some stuff last year. This feels different. This uh, uh, Joe Burrow's healthy. The defense is getting more healthy. I mean, if you're listening to the this at the banks, look out for monkeys. There's monkeys running everywhere through the banks right now because every single player, every single coach just ripped one off of their back. Finally, they get an AFC North win that matters. That might be even bigger than the fact that they're, they're, they're clawing back closer to 500. They had to prove they could beat an AFC, AFC North team and do it at their game. The Ravens tried to run it down their throat. They weren't able to do it, and it, it does. This is just a total different tone changer for this team moving forward. The season has never felt alive. They might be. They might have the best – Super Bowl uh, odds of any two and three team right now when you consider <laughs> right. doing that against the Ravens as good as Joe Burrow is playing. It seems like a whole new season is upon us. There it is, Jay. I mean, what a I stark know. difference. And maybe we're blowing this out of proportion. Are we blowing? That's Maybe that's the question. Are we blowing this difference out of proportion? It just feels like tone and relevancy. Natasha B was right on. Like tone and relevancy in the season and how hard this climb will be versus how ide almost ideally positioned they could be if they can come out of this with a win are just 
it's such a wide gap of just the feel of this entire year. Yeah, because, I mean, the schedule doesn't change. You're still going to play the Giants in week six and in Cleveland in week seven, but one and four and you're playing those teams and you're like, oh, you know, can they get a win against them? But at two and three and you're like, those are those both should be wins. And now all of a sudden you're above 500. And it, it is I maybe the the positive side, the winning side might be a little overstated, but the losing side is not. It is it is dire and it is dark if they do not get this win on Sunday. I mean, momentum and confidence are just so important and mm-hmm. you got to stack wins when you can. And the momentum and confidence that would come from getting win number one and then getting a win against one of the best teams in the NFL and one of your biggest rivals and in division, all these things you've struggled with in, in, you know, in recent years, we know what the Ravens have been to them. We know what the Ravens are right now. And there's so much the type of team that people are, that cr- criticism has been levied against this franchise that that they can't really beat because they will out physical them they they will knock them in the submission right trench warfare is is the type of game the Bengals supposedly don't want to play and don't want to win you know I asked Zach Taylor yesterday um, specifically about like why do you feel like you're better built this year to win games in the AFC North after what happened last year. And he says, well, you know, we got a quarterback. So that's a big one, right? You know, kind of opens with that almost with a laugh. Like, look, with, with Burrow, they feel like they can take on anything that this division has to offer. And, and there's plenty of proof in the pudding there. 21 and 22 happened. They won the division. And they did it with not as good of an offensive line, certainly, as they have right now. Um, the, the issue being on the defensive side. But uh, I, I think that it's just such a telltale game for where they're really at and how far they maybe have to go. And you just know if they're one in four and they have far to go, I, I just, you know, you just will feel like they don't have enough to climb all the way out. Yeah. And with Burr, I mean, yeah, the complimentary football thing and you need the defense, but Burrow feels different this year because there, there's so many other pieces. You mentioned the offensive line is playing so much better. They're getting so much contributions from all the other people on offense. It almost kind of feels like the offense last year after Burrow got hurt and Jake Browning just came in and distributed and let guys make play. Didn't do anything crazy spectacular. And and Burrow hasn't really been asked to do anything amazing this year. It's just get the get the easy completions, get the quick completions, keep moving the chains. He's 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 gonna make those plays at times and you're gonna get in crunch time and he's gonna come up with a huge drive. But it it doesn't feel like it's all on Burrow. Yes, he's the he's he's what drives everything offensively. But you you've just got so many other parts that can really help this team. The running game is so much better, and I don't think he has to put the entire team on his shoulders. And I, that's a great spot to be in. I don't know. I feel like they do. I feel like he does need it on his shoulders. I feel like he does need now. Not that not that the passing game has to carry things which has been the case before because of yes it. i mean but i think his ability to go up there get them into the right place lead into the run if they need to that i mean that helps everybody but inevitably because the defense is such a liability right now like i i do think that it it, it is on his shoulders I, I i do feel like he needs to kind of carry them uh you know let's let's put there uh Burrow talked yesterday, and 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 can he carry them? To me, is the question. And this is a little bit of Joe Burrow, and then we can kind of piggyback off of this topic a little bit after after hearing a little bit from Joe Burrow from his rather intense press conference on Wednesday. How important is getting off to a fast start in this specific game, knowing the way Baltimore wants to play time of possession battle? Paramount. That's you have to. Otherwise, they're just going to eat the clock up, run the ball. We know how well they how well they run it, so we have to to start fast and give ourselves as many opportunities as we can. What did you learn from playing Baltimore? You say you learned how to how to play the teams. What did specifically did you learn about Baltimore? You got to be aggressive out the gate. You can't let the game come to you because your possessions are going to be so limited. Uh, I'm going to have to play damn near perfect. That's how I'm preparing. So 
Um, it's an exciting opportunity. As a test, we've seen on Wednesday and a while, I mean, why, why is that? Why do you feel like it's been kind of ranch matching up for you? Maybe? It's a big game. It's a big game. We know what our record is. You know, we know the opportunities we have going forward, but it's our first divisional opponent. We're one and three. Uh, we need to get this one, and it's a uh, it's a big game for the Bengals. Then we asked you, I think that was a better city game. Now that you're a few weeks in playing Baltimore, do you feel like this is closer to a measuring stick game for where y'all are at, where y'all want to go? I think every week is a measuring stick game. You you go out and try to prove yourself every week, no matter who your opponent is. Um, you know, whenever you play a divisional opponent, that's the intensity intensity level raises a little bit. We you know those games count count more towards the standings. So uh, big game. Yeah, I mean, it, it we're we're confident in our group. You know, we're we're rolling on offense right now, which is, uh, you know, we've still left some some points out there. Which, you know, when you score thirty three, thirty four back to back, and you feel like that. You've left points on the board. You know, it's a good spot to be as an offense. So, you know, we're going to continue to, you know, chase perfection, trying to score on every drive. And, you know, it's a big opportunity. We thrive in these moments. We're excited about it, you know, in front of our fans that, that we're going to need on Sunday. I hope they're excited too. Uh, so we're putting in the work this week to, to go out and put our best foot forward. Damn near perfect, Jay. Yeah, you know, I, I I don't think that's him just talking and saying words. I think he feels that way. Like he he feels the path here. The path here is them posting thirty plus, at least, right? And him having to be absolutely great, no turnovers, make the vast majority of the plays that are in front of him and be damn near perfect. I, I think that's true. I think that's how they win. And that's how they're going to have to win against great teams for a while is going to be Joe Burrow being damn near perfect. He can do it. We've certainly seen him do it. And when you count him out and you put him in a big game, he's typically played some of his best football. But see, I, that's where maybe I differ from your thought on that a little bit. Yeah, the running game. But just because of the state of things on the other side, man, it's it just it's Joe's got to carry them, and more so than more so than in a long time. Yeah, what I was referring to more is you're, you're not he's not having to make super tight window throws and unreal throws on every play. That you've got a lot of guys, a lot of weapons that are winning, and, and he's smart enough to get the ball where it needs to go and a check down, even if it doesn't turn into a first down. You just have that confidence that it can that he can keep it going. I just don't. He yes, he has to be great and and maybe damn near perfect, but he doesn't have to be Superman. Just play within the scope of the offense and 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 do what the play tells him to do. And that damn near perfect line. I mean, yeah, there's some truth to it. There also might be a little prodding, a little challenge to the defense. To you know, I don't know how much they pay attention to what he says in these these news conferences, but I'm sure those guys are like, well, wait, you, why you got to be perfect? We're it's not like we're going to guarantee to give up a touchdown every single drive. It, it seems like it sometimes, mm. but I, I, <laughs> I mean, maybe that's part of part of this new leadership uh, model that he's trying to adopt as well, or, you know, you, you nudge the defense a little bit and, and issue them a challenge. And, um, but, but yeah, I just, he has to be his best, but he doesn't have to play above that. He doesn't have to play outside of himself and just do superhuman things. They've got the pieces all around him. And I think this, this unit as a whole has to carry this team, not so much just Joe. Yeah, no, I, I agree, but you know, he's so much uh, the one that's processing all of that and putting it together. You can't have plays, you know, the miscommunication that caused the interception with Jamar. Like, yeah, that's a thing where, Oh, I wouldn't change what I did. And it was just a thing that happens. Well, that can't happen against Baltimore. Your margin for error is too thin. You can't have, you know, the, it went your way on fourth down before halftime. When you threw the ball on the flat, that can't happen. Like Baltimore, let's makes that tackle. Kyle Hamilton makes the tackle that Nick <laughs> yeah. Scott misses. Okay. Like those are the things that you, you can't miss those opportunities. You can't have those issues. 
you can't have last year. Now they're happy Geno Stone is on their team now, but the 27 24 game in week two last year, mm-hmm. you know, the play where, oh, Geno Stone got me on that one. That can't happen. They're, they are not at a place as a complete team that that stuff can happen. He needs to have no interceptions. He needs to have, you know, scoring drives where they're scoring on the majority of their drives, preferably touchdown. They can't be bad in the red zone. Like it just had. Now, the good news is they feel like they're in a good place to go do that. This Baltimore defense will be a much stiffer test than Carolina and Washington were. So we'll see. Um, but there, you know, with, with what's going to be happening on the other side of the ball, um, I, I, I do think that this needs to be one of his best games for them to win. That there's a, but there's a reason that they're confident in him to be able to do that. That's why he makes $275 million. Mm-hmm. That's why exactly. they're built the way that they're built because they believe and everyone gains confidence in what Joe Burrow is and what he can be. The other thing said here, Jay, and, and, and it is when you start drawing up how you win and maybe better off how you lose this game. Um, it's, Where this game stands at halftime, we're in that like midway through the second quarter. We saw this in the disaster at M&T Bank on the Thursday game last year. The Bengals got down a little bit, but they they clawed their way back. They scratched their way back. And when Burrow's wrist snaps, they got themselves right back to even. They withstood the early rush of having to deal with a short week on the road, these north road games, prime time, all that stuff that that was. And that was so massive. That's why when you heard in the aftermath of that injury, gosh, it was so demoralizing beyond anything, even just uh, in the micro of that game, because they felt like they had gotten the game back to right where they wanted it to be. Mm -hmm. You didn't fall behind early. Now you can start playing your game. You can you can start playing the type of game that you want to play. If this game is them down at the end of the first quarter and halftime by seven or two scores, good night, Irene. Mm. This is not a game. We've seen the ball, the Ravens, like you know, give up these meltdowns at the end. But the that's the likelihood of that happening is so small. This has got to be a game the Bengals need to control or be close in and not get down early. They're not good at coming back from behind. The Ravens are great at putting teams away. The Bengals are not built to stop a team from running it down their throat consistently. They need to turn it into a game where Todd Munkin feels the pressure for Lamar Jackson to throw it more and not feel like they can just sit there and hammer the run all day long. Challenge that patience. Get a lead. Don't fall behind. Paramount was the word that Burrow Fire mm-hmm. off. Dan Pitcher said it's it's up to us not to use the early drives as a feeler. They've done that in the past in a lot of games this year. They have to come out with their best stuff immediately. It needs to fire off immediately. They need to get the lead or stay right there, right off the jump. Do not fall for, fall behind. The possessions are limited, but just due to the way that Baltimore plays, all of that combination is tell me what the score is at the end of the first quarter. And I probably can tell you if the Bengals even have a chance in this one. Yeah. And it's not just about surviving. I mean, you mentioned it, the, the, the Ravens get them out of that, that run first mindset. You know, I mentioned this on the show earlier this week, they, they've shown a tendency to do that, that sometimes they just give up on the run if they get behind early. And if you can do that, if you could come out and go touchdown, touchdown, first two drives, even touchdown field goal, and, and then maybe that changes Baltimore's mindset offensively. And and they do, like, like the AFC Championship game last year, just curiously abandon the run and, and put it on Lamar's back. And um, I just – that is the way to win. I, I it's, it's strange because th- there was so much talk this week about the – how Baltimore limits possessions. And I think that stems from in two of the last three games, the Bengals have played against them. They got, they got seven possessions in the uh, week two game last year, and they got eight in that playoff game in 2022. But that's not normally the case that I looked in the Joe Burrow era, they've averaged 10 possessions per game against the Ravens and 10.6 against everybody else. They've had 13 possession games against Baltimore. I think it's more of a recency thing with two of those last three games being like that. In in the Burrow era, they've had four games with either seven or eight possessions. So two of them I just mentioned were against the Ravens. The other two this year, 
New England and Washington. <laughs> so I get it's I think it's more of a recency thing where they're they they they're more concerned about the lack the the lack of possessions and the limited time that they hold the ball. And sometimes that's not a bad thing. You know, if, if you are going out and hitting big plays and driving right down the field and scoring quick, you'll live with that. If you're scoring on two thirds, three fourths of your possessions, doesn't matter how many you have, you're going to have enough points to win the game. Yeah, you know, if, if Derrick Henry runs for three different 70 yard touchdown runs, then you'll get plenty of possessions. Yeah, exactly. Right? I, I just I just don't think it's about possessions. It's yeah. about scoring. Like I was I was doing Mo's show and we were on Tuesday and, and a fan that was there came up and started talking about, you know, the possessions thing. And I was, you know, how can you counter it? And as, scoring yeah. like it, it, it really, it's you, you can, you can counter it and say, Oh, we're going to run the ball and give your defense a breather. And that matters. Like you, you, you want them to have some time to be able to catch their breath on the sideline. But what helps them catch their breath is knowing that you're, offense just scored a touchdown right mm -hmm. that is what they need and, and kept them in the game and kept them in with with hope or knowing believing that a stop can lead to another touchdown and the game changing real quickly they they just so badly need that you that's more than anything so they're more equipped to go out there and try to run it i think the 12 personnel stuff what eric all is bringing them is a is a big deal in the AFC North, like in, in these types of games. They can be more physical, and, and that can help them grind out tough yards and and run the ball when they need to a little bit more and and do a little bit more of play action and keep Baltimore off balance and not just sitting back like they feel like they can just watch you in eleven personnel all day and be prepared for that. That helps, right? That that helps, but I just think more. It's not about style; it's about results. It's about outcome of these drives, and and whether it's a sixty-three yard Jamar Chase highlight reel um, or twelve plays seventy-five yards, like it doesn't. It, it really, at the end of the day, only matters what the result is more than more than anything. You'll take twelve plays seventy-five yards. Sure, uh, that's great. Like there's benefits there, but the degree of difficulty is so much higher. Take points, get points, gain momentum, get the crowd into it. All of that stuff will, will go a long way. So given this conversation question for you. Yeah. We saw it last week, the double dip. That that gave them control of the game. Gave them a two-score game, a two-score lead, and they just pretty much controlled that second half. If Baltimore loses the toss, do the Bengals defer and try to get that double dip again? Or do they take the opening kick and say, we want to throw the first punch. We want to score first. We want the ball first. That gives you the chance to have more possessions. What do you think they do if it's if that decision is theirs? It's a great question because there's two things where we've heard last year when, they, when we talked a lot about this where they said, you know, it's sometimes you know, the deferral is, is what they prefer. Right. But sometimes the game style dictates that you want to do something different and this would be the ultimate example of that time of get your offense out there setting the tone going out there and and getting a lead and landing that first punch i'm with you yeah i, I would probably take the ball here but the other side is like you know what there was something to that double dip thing that that kind of keeps you going and and they have momentum and that's in recent memory for these guys uh of of right of what they can do and, and try to make that happen so i I, it's probably a coin flip decision there, but I would, you know, the style of this game and your strength being what it is as an offense, I'd probably rather go out there and 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 take the ball first. Yeah, I wonder though because you know, say say it's seven to seven at the end of the first quarter, both teams score on their opening drive. If if the Bengals go down, they take the ball first, they score, and then Baltimore comes back and scores, and you're like, oh, okay, it's the kind of game it's going to be. That feels a lot different than Baltimore gets the ball first, they score, and you come right back and match them. And I just think that that feels so much better, at even though the score is 7-7, seven to seven, same point in the game, I just think you feel better almost with the counter punch as opposed to the opening punch, and then you still have that opportunity for the for the double dip if you let Baltimore go first. And the other the other thing that we're not we're discounting, say the Bengals take the ball first and don't score and then Baltimore does, then you're then you're really in a hurt world hurt. Yeah. I mean, you got to score. Like yeah. that's just these possessions matter, these possessions mean a ton. 
you know, the outcome of the first two possessions for the Bengals offense and defense, you know, it, where does this game stand after two possessions, a piece, these are going to be big, big parts, bigger than most games. Yeah. Um, you know, they're always important, but more high leverage than most, how this thing gets out of the gate. I think um, not that they can't come back. You certainly can. And the Ravens have squandered before, but I think more important than most. All right. Let's flip forward and uh, let's get a little bit of a let's get get into our segments here. Run past our boots. We got some stats. We got some predictions. Growler bet. Uh, what do we got for run past our boots? You got any good ones in your mind this week? Yeah, I do. Um, so I had I came up with a couple of them. All right. Well, what's going to be greater on Sunday? The Ravens rushing yards. The Ravens passing yards. Or the combined punting yards? Do we think, I mean, normally in a game, combined punting yards would be the most, but do we think anybody's actually going to punt in this game? <laughs> it it doesn't feel very conducive to seeing punters as much as everyone has enjoyed the uh, Ryan Rico show. And I'm enjoying getting to know Ryan Rico even more, by the way, who's a yeah. delightful human. Uh, I, I do not think we will see a lot of punts. So I'm with you on that. I, I will say Ravens, rushing yards will be i will run with that as the most ravens rushing yards i will pass on ravens passing yards and i will i will boot combined punting yards i don't don't think we'll see as much punts i mean the ravens have been running for more than they throw for they've been running at a record pace uh specifically the last two weeks as they've leaned into it again and gotten the lead and been able to just salt these games away just keeping teams just before. I mean, you watch some of these reps from Buffalo and in and, and Dallas, and, and they don't even know where the ball is until it's past them. I mean, they're just they're they're not just missing gaps. They don't even know if they were supposed to be in the gap. You know, where are they supposed to be? These runs, the the zone read stuff that has popped outside, whether they give it to Henry or Lamar takes it or whatever, there's just so much confusion and they have such a hard time getting to the spots especially when they pop outside they've been able to get i mean it's not just people think that you see a lot of the highlights and obviously the one that opened the game last week of derrick henry you kind of going up the gut a little bit i mean so much of what they've done is just getting to the outside either making one tackle miss um it where there's just a lot of space out there and running for 10 to 15 yards like it's it's almost like candy from a baby stuff when they start doing that and so they can just move it so effectively. They don't need to throw it. They're not throwing it that much. So I, I'll, I'll run with, with Ravens rushing. Yeah. They, they're averaging 220 rushing yards per game, which is just insane. It, and through the first four weeks of a season, nobody's done that since 2006. Uh, the 2006 Falcons averaged 234 since 1970. The Ravens are one of only seven teams to do it. It's average 220 per game. It, it just it's mind boggling, and what and they're doing it in chunks six six point three eight yards per carry. That's the third most since nineteen seventy. But that said, I, I'm going to run with the passing yards. I just I think the Bengals are going to sell out to stop the run. Um, doesn't always mean you're going to be able to do it, but I, I think Burrow and the offense are going to come out firing and scoring, and and maybe the the Ravens go a little bit away from the original plan and throw it more. So I'm gonna I'm gonna run with Ravens passing yards pass on Ravens uh, rushing yards and then I'll, I'll boot the punting yards too. I just, even with Rico's huge leg and even if he punts twice, it could be 120 yards. Um, I just, I don't think that that's got a shot to win this run pass or boot. That's a really um, good one. That's a really good one. I want to just to piggyback on that strategy idea of, you know, selling out against the run. You know, I, I think that's the, that's the method because if there's one thing you're hoping for, it's a turnover. It's a pick. Mm-hmm. OK, they're probably going to be scoring anyway. You're force Lamar to throw it and go cover one on one and be like, look, yeah, they'll beat you some like. But you know what? I, you got to say, I'll take Dax and Cam Taylor Britt and DJ Turner up against Bateman and Flowers and and those guys or even covering the tight ends and say that maybe one or two of those could end up in a turnover and and you can win those more those man-to-man matchups more than you can if you're just giving that much space for them 
to run because you're worried about getting beat with the pass. I think I think you're playing a bunch of single high um, mm-hmm. and you're dropping the safety, dropping Vaughn down into the box uh, and, and hoping that looks better. But, you know, the Bengals run defense just – will that even matter, right? Like yeah. <laughs> we saw them selling out a lot last week and it didn't matter much against Chuba Hubbard and Carolina. Like, you know, they, they've got to try to, they've got to try to look a lot different this week and maybe they do, but uh, selling out certainly makes more sense than, than playing it normal. Yeah. I mean, you're, you've got Dax and KM high picks, DJ Turner too. You got these guys for a reason. Let them get out there and cover one on one. And and Geno Stone's no Geno Stone knows this Ravens offense better than anyone. And let him play the single high and play center field and hope Lamar throws one to him. Um, I, I have another one. What will be the longest play of the game? A Ravens rush, a Bengals pass, or a field goal? That's a great one right there. Hmm. Um, I will say. I'll say a Bengals pass. You know, we've had Burrow now three weeks in a row with explosive, explosive passes, you know, Mm -hmm. where 40 plus yard games, um, you know, you had the, the Burton one, you had Jamar, you, you, you've had a bunch uh, that have popped off for you. Obviously everything that happened against Washington, they had multiple. So that seems to be a thing. It's kind of coming back. They're finding those explosives. Uh, and that's something they're going to be trying to do against Baltimore. So I think they find one. I'll uh, I'll pass. And I'll say, I mean, there's going to be a long Ravens rush. I don't know if they'll go over 50, though, and there probably will be a 50-yard field goal. So I'll, I'll say field goal, and then I guess I'll boot Ravens rush. I think the Ravens just have a lot of 20s. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes. You know, I don't, I don't necessarily know that we're going to see the highlight we saw last week of there goes Derrick Henry for 80. Or and even if even a long one doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be longer than what the longest field goal will be. So I'll take my chances on that. Yeah, that's the thing. If you sell out for the run and there's a missed tackle, then it's, it's it could go forever. It could turn into a seventy very quickly. But I'm going to run with the field goal. I just it's it's McPherson and Tucker. I mean, there you figure there's going to be at least one fifty, and there might be a sixty yarder in this game, and that's just a lot to ask for for a, for a scrimmage play. So I'm going to run with the field goal. I'm going to pass on the Ravens rush. I do think they break one and uh, I'll boot the Bengals pass. Um, even though it's there, I mean, th- this offense is humming and, and you could see it happening, but I just, I think those other two are way more likely to, to rip off a super long one than, than this Bengals offense, this Bengals passing game. Okay. Uh, growler bet, Jay, let's get to this week's growler bet. Okay. Um, I think this is an easy one. Uh, in what we're picking in that Ravens rushing yards. I mean, the last two weeks, they are averaging 6.9 yards per carry and 273 rushing yards per game. That is insane. That is the last two weeks as they have just said, you know what? We can just do this and teams can't stop it. Buffalo couldn't stop it. Dallas couldn't stop it. And now here is a Bengals run defense that looked like it was going to be terrible going uh, against the Ravens. Can they stop it? it? It makes for a wide spectrum of potential choices here. Where are, we, where are you going, Jay? Oh, yeah, I, I, should say, I should say before you do this, we're, we need to induce winners, okay? Yeah, we do. So let's – I'm tired of having us so close, you guys. First of all, you guys need to be better, okay? Just like the Bengals. But like the better. Just be better, okay? That said, I'm going to try to open your the degree – decrease the degree of difficulty and go within three on either side. So you get within three yards on either side of this number. You'll be a winner. The tiebreaker will essentially be whoever's closest. If we have multiple people in the range. So it's a six yard window. Look at these gifts. Look at these (laughs) gifts. We are giving you, you could have some delicious Cincy lights or a full barbell up at nation at one of our live shows. If you win the growler, but remember you're sending these, to the growler podcast at gmail.com put growler in the header make us laugh we'll give you shout outs with that uh hashtag Bengals growler bet on twitter still works as well you can drop your answers in there all right jay now go for it yeah i i think the ravens are gonna walk out of paycor with their head hung low scuffling kicking their feet mumbling themselves saying how in the heck did we not get to 200 yards on that defense why did we take those knees I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go 198. 
So they're over 200 and they come back to it at the victory knees. Well, maybe the, yeah, maybe the knees at the end of the, at the end of the half, if, if, if there's okay. uh, only a few seconds, well, it would only be one knee, but, but yeah, that's just, just on the cusp of 200. Boy, it's, it's hard to predict a low number here, Jay. It is. It just, <laughs> when you see what they've been, even if the Bengals are dead set to try to slow it down, They've just been so good at it. The Bengals have been so poor defensively in stopping the run. We've seen the tackling issues that have happened. I mean, the Patriots have nothing, and they went for 170. Um, we Everybody's been going up over well over 100. And these guys, I, I think they're going to be right in that same range they have been the last couple of weeks. I'll, I'll go. I'll take 270 uh, and, and say that they're right where they were the last two weeks. I mean – Right in the same spot. I don't. I don't know that the Bengals are going to have the defense that can that can stop them. They're going to have to outscore them, hmm. and that's what this is going to come down to. So that's that's my uh, that's my number. Again, it's a wide spectrum. It is. If this thing, I'll tell you what. If that thing, if that number is under your number, or else is under one seventy five, the Bengals win. Like if they can find a way to keep it contained, because. Now, granted, Lamar can toast you just like any. It's why he's the MVP. He can do all of it, right? But I still think if you're forcing him to be to beat you that way, you can get the turnover. You can you can make a couple of stops there. Whereas if they're just demoralizing you with the ground game, you're they're playing their game and they're going to go win. So I, you know, under two hundred, under one seventy five. That's an important number, obviously, in this game. All right, Jay, predictions. What do you? Yeah. I really want to kind of go against the trend here and say this is going to be a way lower scoring game than people think, but I just can't. And, and it'll look foolish if it ends up being what we thought it would, we think it's going to be. If I go high and it goes low, I'm wrong, just like everybody else. So I think it's going to be a high scoring game. I think it's going to be a back and forth game. I, maybe five lead changes, um, wow. but I, I think the Ravens have the ball last. The Bengals can't figure out a way to get a stop, and the the Ravens do win it. So that kind of contradicts my taking the knee comment from before. But um, I've got Ravens 31, Bengals 29 with a final drive win for Baltimore. Yeah, wow. Okay. I will – Um. so Joe Burrow has been a home underdog since 2021 five times. Um. Three went to overtime, and all five were decided by exactly three points. Isn't that crazy? It is. It's it's unbelievable. Now you got the most recent ones. Obviously, are a couple of the couple against Kansas City, where every game mm-hmm. is decided by three points. Um, the overtimes before that were against San Francisco, Green Bay, and Minnesota, all in the 2021 season. All overtimes, all field goals deciding it in overtime. I so you have to pick a three point margin here. I think by by virtue of the way that the Bengals offense is playing, I I think that they can keep up. I just I I like their attitude. You have to like where Burrow's at, both mentally and the way he's playing and the way this offense is cooking right now. That's enough to keep up with anybody. I, I just don't know that I can say it about the defense right now. I don't know that you can confidently think that what the Ravens did the last two weeks to Buffalo and Dallas isn't exactly what they're going to be able to do against the Bengals. And that's just too much. It's, it's, it's one thing if they are able to run and move the ball and score some, it's another thing if they are just shoving it down your throat. And I think they're going to be able to shove it down the Bengals throat. And that's going to be just enough. They keep it close. They're right there. Maybe it ends up a Tucker field goal at the end. Maybe the Bengals score and and have a drive fall short or whatever. But I have Ravens 34, Bengals 31, high scoring game. Just like you, you're you saying, I, I, it just feels like it's going to end up that way, even on minimized possessions. And uh, it, it's a tough one. They've got to find a way to win. Yeah. And again, we're talking about three score, two, two point, three point games. One turnover, one pick, one flying Cam Taylor Britt interception, mm-hmm. one Logan Wilson, Jermaine Pratt fumble recovery, and 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 you see this whole thing change. We go back to last year. 
the Geno Stone interception. You know, we go to the 1917 game from week five a couple of years ago, the Stanley Morgan shovel pass where they didn't score when they should have right there down there on the goal line. Like these high leverage moments, turnovers, red zone third and fourth downs are going to be the difference when you have these games that are just these teams are so evenly matched typically and these offenses are both performing at such a high level yeah it, i just i'd be stunned if it's anything more than than three points yeah we will see uh we'll see which version of the walkout you guys get on <laughs> sunday night uh, I am going to guess most Bengals fans know which one they prefer, but we'll be here to give you either one on the walkout presented by Cincy Shirts. Maybe there will be another celebratory shirt. You Maybe we'll see some of you in your Uncle Rico shirts. Remember, oh, yeah. use, use the code GrowlerPod there uh, at CincyShirts.com, and uh, you can get 10% off your entire order, not to mention the Uncle Rico shirts, mm -hmm. uh, which are out from last week right now. So anyway, all right, Jay, off we go. Uh, who day light will be up tomorrow. We'll dive into some of your questions. If you have some that you want to get in, send them to the growler podcast at gmail.com. Mark and I will uh, tackle those and have a little fun. And then we'll, uh, we'll talk to you in the walkout on Sunday. Have a good one, everybody.